Welcome to the Calvary Podcast. Get ready to dive into an inspiring message. Our aim is to share teachings that bring transformation and hope to your life. So open your heart, be ready to listen, and prepare for a powerful encounter with the Word. Let's get started. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. Turn there with me. Acts the fourth chapter. I'm going to continue my series on the protocol of prayer. The protocol of prayer. We've been learning some powerful principles. We've been seeing God do some amazing things. And uh, we're going to just carry this on. We were in Acts chapter 4 as we concluded last week. I want to pick that up and go from there. Let me just remind you, how did we get here in this study, in this series? Uh, we've been noticing a protocol, a pattern. Uh, someone said to me recently, Pastor, your, your title of the series is The Protocol of Prayer. I want to make sure I understand the word protocol. Well, protocol can be used in a broader sense, but in essence, it is the pathway to presence. It is, it is the order I follow to access a certain place, an important place, an important person. For instance, I, I shared with you back in the beginning, there is uh, the higher the person, the more important the person, the more obvious we see this. In other words, if you're going to get to visit the president in the Oval Office, there is quite a protocol before you get in the Oval Office, I can promise you. And uh, you'll, you'll get a speech from Secret Service. They will tell you what to do and what not to do. Things as, uh, as detailed as they tell you you cannot walk into the Oval Office with your hands in your pockets. Don't walk in there like that because they're protecting the president and they don't, they don't know what's in your pocket. So if you want to meet the president, you come out like that, okay? Now, if you were to meet a king or a dignitary on that level, there would be protocol. But you and I are not approaching the White House. You and I are not approaching the Oval Office. You and I are not approaching an earthly throne. We're approaching the king of kings and the Lord of lords, the creator of the universe, the God who made all things, the God the Bible says if you want to know who he is, there's nothing impossible for him. There's not one thing he cannot do. No, no, no uh, sea he cannot part. No dead body he cannot raise. You understand? So if we understand who he is and we have just the opportunity to access his presence, then tell me the protocol because I want to get there. Anybody with me with this thing? All right, so that's what we're looking at. And as we look to, through the book of Acts, which is the historical eyewitness record of how the church began. Do you know that? Sometimes we just read you know, our Bible and read this book and that book. I want to make sure you get this. The book of Acts is the eyewitness historical account of how the church began. It's not something that was just passed down. No, it, the author, Luke, the physician, traveled with Jesus and, and traveled with this early church and saw these things at the end of Jesus' ministry, but primarily through the local church or the apostles, Luke recorded his eyewitness account of what Jesus had done. And so we notice as the book of Acts began, Jesus said, you go to Jerusalem. Acts 1 says that. I'm going to get to Acts 4. Don't worry. He said, you go to Jerusalem and you wait for the gift of my Father. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. You're going to be clothed with power. And then that's going to be the birth of the church. But he said that what you do first is go pray. Go pray. And for 10 days they prayed. In Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, prophetically, the Holy Spirit descended. They were baptized in the Holy Spirit. They were clothed with power, and the church was birthed. Amen. We go into Acts chapter 3, and we find Peter and John going to the temple at the time of what? Prayer. And in the context of prayer, the lame man was healed. The first miracle recorded that began to happen through the apostles after they had received what Jesus promised. And the lame man runs in the temple and messes everything up. How many understand what I'm saying? Have you ever noticed that, that, that religion does not have place for the Spirit of God to move? Did you hear? Let me try this again. Religion does not have space to see the power of God manifested. And so what we're after here at Calvary is not a religious experience, but a, an encounter with Jesus Christ a personal relationship that allows you and I to experience everything the New Testament says we can experience. So they, they, the lame man runs in. 
He, he runs right into the temple. He goes right past their protocol because he's already met the king. You understand, if you've already met the king of the universe, you really don't have much time for religious protocol. How many can understand? Okay, understand what I'm saying. So they're so upset, the religious leaders, they bring Peter and John in and, and arrest them, put them in jail, bring them out the next morning, threaten them, and say, you, have, you cannot preach anymore about Jesus. You cannot pray for anyone anymore. You have to stop this. And they threatened them. So what did they do? They went back. Tell me what did they do? They prayed. So the protocol in the church that Jesus established is that we pray. We don't pray last. We pray when? First. We lay a foundation of prayer. I want you to hear me today. This isn't just for the apostles. It's for the church. How many born-again believers in the house today? Let me see your hand. You're the church. And so when we say church, we're not addressing this building. We're talking about you and I. And, and the protocol for you and I to begin every day is prayer. The protocol to begin any relationship would be prayer. The protocol to begin any gathering of the believers like you see us do here before Sunday morning is that we pray. We understand there is a protocol that allows heaven to come to earth. How many believe that's a better way to live? That we live beyond our limitations and access the ability of God. And so the protocol is prayer. We pray and God responds to prayer. Then we get a chance to tell people what the kingdom's all about. So let's go back to verse 23 in Acts chapter 4 and let's look at their prayer. Now this is a prayer when you've been threatened. This is a prayer when people say, you better close your mouth and go away. This is a prayer when the culture says, we don't want to hear about Jesus. We don't want to hear about your faith. We don't want you to tell us what you believe. We want you to close your mouth, go in a corner. Your faith is marginalized. It's not current anymore. How do you pray when you're threatened not to teach, not to pray, not to represent Jesus? Acts 4, <clears throat> verse 23. So we, well, let, let me, yeah, 23, I'll start there. So we begin to read. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them, all their threats. When they heard this, what did they do? Raised their voices together in prayer. I love that. They raised their voices in prayer. They didn't mumble. They didn't murder. Well, they didn't do that either. They didn't murmur. They didn't go meditate. They didn't do yoga. They prayed boldly. Someone say boldly. They raised their voices in prayer. These guys knew how to pray. They were praying like that when the church was birthed. They were praying like that when God began to use them in miracles. And they understood that if God's going to help us in a moment of this challenge, we better raise our voices and pray. They were sincere and diligent. Have you noticed when you really become serious about praying, you'll start to raise your voice and pray. You begin to not worry about who hears you, what they think, and what they say. You say, I need to talk to God. So they raise their voices together. Someone say together. There's power when we pray together. The church has always, listen to me, been built on the concept that we can talk to God anytime, any place. He's always with us. But part of the impact of the church is when we pray together. There's a dynamic there. So they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Now, what did they do? They immediately put their focus on God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. They began to pray the word. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and his anointed one. That's from Psalms 2. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will decided beforehand should happen. Do you see what had transpired in their life as the prayer and the word got together? They realized, wait a minute. We don't have to be afraid of these guys that crucified Jesus. They could not have touched him if God had not allowed it. They could not have killed him if Jesus had not surrendered. 
wait a minute. God is in control. How many understand that today? They began to see what looked like their greatest tragedy literally <clears throat> became their greatest victory because they began to see through the eye of prayer and the power of the Word of God. When you and I begin to pray, God takes what the devil meant to destroy us and turns it around to be a blessing in your life. I read this recently in, in our Five Star Man 45-Day Challenge. I, I, I thought, wow, th this was really good. It said, did you know the devil was a gambler? You say, well, what does that mean? You mean he goes over to Tunica? No, that's not what I'm talking about. He may be there. Sorry if you went to see him. But anyway, see... <clears throat> So, so this, is what, this, is what, this is what this means. What does it mean that the, the devil is a gambler? Because it, we, we read in the Bible that if the thief is caught, he has to pay back double what he stole. So the devil's betting every day that he's going to steal, kill, and destroy at your house, and we don't know how to pray and make him pay for everything he's done. <laughs> so here's the deal. The devil's been betting house money on you. I, if you don't gamble, don't worry about all that. But here's what I'm telling you to say. It's time you make that bad boy pay up. It's time that you get double for your trouble. It's time that we begin to look at life not as a loser, but as a victor. We begin to say, you thought you creed, you did everything. When you killed Jesus, you thought you ended the church. You thought you ended hope. You thought you scattered all of us. But what you need to know is that you may have crucified him, but God raised him from the dead. And what you need to know is you used to just have to worry about one. But now you have all of us. You better watch because what he did we're doing. Is anybody following me? That's what they were praying. You, they're praying, we're not afraid of you. You didn't do anything God didn't allow for his purposes. Now, you don't get there until you pray. How many understand that? We'll talk about that. So, verse 29. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Listen, faith does not deny the reality of a problem. It compares it to the faithfulness of God and says God's able. They said, we heard the threats. See, I've had some people in the last few years say that faith means you just deny there's a problem. I don't have to walk around, there's no threat, 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 there's no threat. That's not what they did. They said, you heard it, I heard it. But you're God. You get the last word. You understand that? You went to the doctor and you got a diagnosis that, that was shocking to you. You don't have to walk around and say, I didn't go to the doctor, I didn't go to the doctor, I didn't go to the doctor. You don't have to go around and say, I didn't hear it, I didn't hear it, I didn't hear it. What you need to say is, God, you have the last word. I believe the report of the Lord. I believe that by his stripes I'm healed. I believe that your word is true and faithful. You understand? I heard the threat, but God, I want you to have the final word. That's what praying does. So now, verse 30, stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed. The place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God boldly. Boldness, power, the grace and the goodness of God. I was looking at that verse 30. So, so what happens when we pray? What happens when we pray? When, when, when you're co confronted with a challenge, when the church is confronted with a challenge, I believe our culture today is challenging the church. I believe the devil has thrown down the gauntlet in front of the truth of the Word of God. I believe the church in America today is somewhat like Moses when he went before Pharaoh the first time. And he said, hey, Pharaoh, God sent me. And Pharaoh said, prove it. And Moses threw down his, his staff and it turned into a snake. And Pharaoh looked at his sorcerers and magicians and warlocks and witches. And he said, can you do that? And they threw theirs down and did the same thing. And I think there are a lot of places the church in America today has become paralyzed by the devil's reaction to the hand of God. But if you'll hang in there a minute, if you'll pray, if you'll know who he is and who you are in him, then in a moment, your snake is going to eat their snake. <laughs> and you're going to pick it up. Then That's the only snake handling allowed in the church. All right? And it turns back into the staff of God. See, the devil's trying to match the church right now. 
He's trying to match the church. He's trying to say, I got that. I can do that. He's telling these students. He's telling our Gen Zs, our Gen X, our, 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 our the Alpha Gens, the kids. He's, he's telling them, God doesn't have anything that I don't have. God can't do anything that I can't do for you. God can't meet any need that I can't meet for you. God can't make it work. I can make it work. We need to have an opportunity, an encounter, a lifestyle in front of these generations rising up where we're able to say, I see the threat. I hear the threat. I know the promise, but I know a God who can more than double do anything he can do. I know the God who can meet every need in your life. These generations rising are going to have to see in a praying church that there is a real God who can change every situation. That's where we are. That's, that's what we're doing. And, and, and so I love this. As they prayed, watch, the place they were meeting was shaken. I, I said, Lord, well, you know, what does that look like? What does shaken look like? I, did, I was just researching through the Greek language, and this word shaken means to be blown or moved by a violent wind. Then I thought about Acts chapter 2. There was a rushing mighty wind. And I began to realize, you know, you don't have to stick with one experience a long time ago. You don't have to try to live off yesterday's manna. Anybody with me? We don't have to live off a relationship, an encounter, a moment, a testimony that gets dated. God wants to do today what he did back then. God wants to restore today what he did then. God wants to baptize you in the Holy Spirit as fresh and powerful today as it was the first time that happened in your life. How many believe that our God can do that? So the same mighty, rushing, shaking wind that, that birthed the church was there again when they needed the power of the Holy Spirit. God's faithful. He's not diminishing. We, we have a theology in the church today that said God doesn't do what he used to do. It's, it's kind of like that dated economic principle called the trickle-down economy that all the big boys get the money on the top. Come on, anybody with me? And all the rest of us just get what trickles down of there. I'm telling you, we don't serve a trickle-down God. He doesn't have a hierarchy of who's filled with the Holy Spirit and who gets a little bit left over. When you serve the living God, you can walk in the same freshness and power and anointing of the Holy Spirit that you've ever had at any point in your life. They were shaken. It's interesting. That same word was used in Acts 16, verse 26, when Paul and Silas were praying in that Philippian jail. And it says, as they were singing hymns and praying at midnight, the, 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 the jail was shaken. It said, the foundations were shaken and everybody got set free. Do you know how we again witness, share, demonstrate the reality of God? That we have such a prayer life that the power of God shakes the foundation of every prison house in North Alabama and the crack house and the drug house. And, and, and while we're at it, whoever's going to be the next one there and the White House, <laughs> whoever's going to be, you say, are, am I, what are you saying? Just what I said. Whoever's going to be there, and that, that, that the foundations that are not built on the Word of God encounter a move of the Holy Spirit and America comes back to a faith in God and North Alabama and your house and my house and we have an encounter where the power of God shakes this nation again. The wind of the Holy Spirit. The wind of the Holy Spirit. Let me show you this. Go to Hebrews 12, 27. This shaking thing kind of grabbed me. <laughs> I want to make you see how this works. I want to help you see how this works. It's shaking. They were shaking. The power of God shook. Look, look at this. I, I, I got to tell you something. Somewhere in life, something's going to shake you up. Anybody ever had your foundation shaken? Anybody ever had a storm you didn't see coming? Anybody ever have a day you never thought would come, a moment happen, words you never thought you would hear? Well, this is what we would look at this. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken that has created things so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Leave that up for a minute. Do you know that when you go through the toughest places in your life and it looks like everything you counted on has fallen down and left you, people left you, Money left you. Relationships left you. Confidence left you. Employment left you. Security left you. Do you know anything in this world that is what, what that is created can be shaken and fall? But I have some good news for us. That everything 
that God puts in us. Everything that comes from the Spirit of God, everything that God birthed in a prayer meeting, everything God birthed on His Word, no matter what shakes around you, that's not going to be shaken. God is going to keep that steadfast in your life. I'm thankful to see God doing that. So let's go back. What happened now? Let's finish. We haven't read these verses. So the place was shaken. They were filled with the Holy Spirit again. Someone say, again. Again. You see that pattern. But watch this. It translates out. And they're not just prayer meetings, but how we love each other. Everybody with me? How we treat each other. You know what? The world needs a fresh witness of Christians that love each other. I'm going to say that again. We need a fresh demonstration of Christians that love each other. I don't just mean those that go to Calvary. I mean the church. The church. Red and yellow, black and white. Young and old. Is everybody with me? The church needs to love it. Now, so what do we read? Verse 32. All the believers were what? Is there behind me? Is it there? One in there. Come on. All, Acts 4, 32. All the believers were one in heart and mind. Do you know that's a byproduct of a prayer life, of the move of the Holy Spirit, is that we begin to stand together. We begin to love one another. Come on, everybody with me right now? We're not, we're not identified by our politics. We're not identified only by our race. We're identified by the God we serve by the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. And what we're seeing here is that they, they were in one heart and one mind to the degree. Now relax, I'm not taking an offering now. To the degree, no one claimed that any of his possessions were, was his own, but they shared everything they had. Incredible. Watch this. What happened as a result of that? With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And much grace was upon them all. Keep reading. There were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them and brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet. Do you understand that every time you try to manipulate or create something like that in the flesh, it's never going to work? God's not into building Christian communes. He's into building the gospels that the world hears it, the light of the world. But I want you to understand that as we, that as we are empowered and, and, we, and we're connected and, and, and transformed by the power of God, it, it impacts our everyday life. We have to understand that Christianity is not just Sunday morning. It's how we live and walk and work with each other. Let me show you just one thing real quick. So what did they pray? What did they pray? Remember this. What was their prayer? They said, Lord, consider their threats. Let us speak with boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders. Is that what they pray? Well, go to chapter 5 for a minute real quickly. Look at verse 12. This thing just goes to another level because the protocol of prayer, the priority of prayer. Now, this had never happened. Look at this. <laughs> Acts 5, 12. The apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. Why? This is an answer to chapter 4. They performed many miraculous signs and wonders among the people. And all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. I'll explain that at another time. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, look at this. People brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented with evil spirits. And here it is, guys, I've never seen this. I've never seen this. I've never seen it in any generation, but God did it then, and he's the same God now. And we read, and all of them were healed. All of them were healed. Now, we have a choice when we read something like that. We can scramble to, to try to explain away why it's not happening. We can rewrite our theology to accommodate our uneasiness with a verse like that. Or we can humble ourselves before God and learn how to pray some more. 
and say, oh, God, your word says that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So my choice, instead of rewriting theology and debating and arguing, arguing the absence of the power of God in this current time, I'd rather spend my time praying that God would find a place, a people, an opportunity, a situation where those, those things would happen and God would get all the glory. And God would get all the glory. Do you see, church? Let it challenge your faith. Come on, let's be real and genuine. You read that verse and it said everyone got healed. They, they had people bringing from cities all around. Peter walked down the street and his shadow fell on people and they got healed. Now, you may call that whatever you want to call it. I read it in the Bible. I call it the Word of God. You may have a hundred people tell you why God can't do it now. I always laugh when someone says God can't. Who in the world are you talking about? Do you realize what you just said? Can, if you think somebody else needs... No, 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 I'm not going to go there. It, let, let, help me, Jesus. I, thank you for stopping me right there. If you, if you think that intelligence says God can't, you need another prayer meeting in your life. I can't tell you why, being very transparent. I can't give you the why. I can't tell you the why. I don't know why some here and some there. All I know, there was a place and a time I didn't have to answer that question. It was all. Here's what I want to say. I believe he's the same God. I believe his word's the same word. I believe the Holy Spirit's the same Holy Spirit. I believe God just wants you and I to do what I can. See, I, there's some things I can't do. What I can do is pray. What I can do is believe. What I can do is say, God, you want to do that today. I believe God loves lost people today as much as he loved lost people then. I want to throw a thought at you. There are seven times more people living on the planet today than there were then. So I would say that we need a greater demonstration of the power of God today. I would say we need the power of God released in an amazing way. Let's believe God. Anybody want to believe God with me? I want to get past why is, why not, who is, who's not. And I want to say, God, we're available. God, we're available. God, we don't care who gets the glory if you get the glory. We want your name to be lifted up. Let's believe that. Let's read a verse like that and say, instead of saying why, are you ready? Let's say why not. Instead of why, let's say why not. Why not us? Why not here? Why not now? Why not America? Why not North Alabama? Why not your family? Why not my family? Why not these people were praying? That's what I say. I'm tired of asking why. Anybody can ask why. I want to say why not. That's my prayer. Why not? So let's go to this one more. You got to get this. I got to get this to you before we go. This is important. Let's go to chapter 6. So we're watching this incredible march of the gospel across the known world. Do you really want to hear all of this today? You want to get the whole thing? Okay, okay, thank you. That was two or three. That's enough for me. That's all I need. So look at chapter 6, verse 1. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the King James says multiplying. King James translation. Up until this point, from Acts 2 through Acts 5, this is what we would read. And God added to the church. Something shifted here. Now he says... He was multiplying the church. Now, that's good because 4 plus 4 in addition is what? But in multiplication, 4 times 4 is? Okay. I like multiplication. How many like multiplication? How many like your money multiplying? Okay, that's what I thought. So we like multiplication. We established that. So something shifted here. So let's look at this. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing or multiplying, the Grecian Jews among them, those were Greeks that had converted to Judaism, okay? Complained against the Hebraic Jews, the, the natural-born Jews, Hebraic Jews. They began to complain that they were, their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the Word of God in order to wait on tables. So in other words, said, we need to feed these widows, but we need, to, we need another plan. We're about to see a huge transition in the leadership of the early church, okay? So they said, we need to do something. Brothers, choose seven from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and we'll give our attention to prayer 
See the priority of prayer? He said, we're not going to change that. We can't let growth change our priorities. Amen. We can't let blessing change our priorities. Are you hearing me? I can't let the blessing of yesterday rob me of my prayer priority today. Amen. I can't stand on a blessing and lose my anointing. Okay, so uh, we'll turn this responsibility over to them and we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. Now, what happened? This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and of the Holy Spirit also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenius, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed uh, and laid their hands on them. What did they do? They prayed and laid their hands on them. What happened? So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, multiplied, another level of, of winning people to Christ. And a, look at this. First time we read this, a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Now, let's look at this. Let's dig back down. Look at verse 1. What, what was the catalyst of this entire leadership jump? Jump in the gospel. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among the complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked and the daily distribution of food. Here we are, four chapters into the church, and they had a church problem. Now we, okay, four chapters in, there was a challenge, maybe a misunderstanding, but they had an issue. The devil's trying to get drama in the church. Issues in the church, four chapters in. Let me help you, church, listen to me. Somehow we have developed this idea. We become so fragile in our faith. And we've heard this talk. Well, if there's any issue in a church, God can't be there. Hmm. Looks like he was there. I don't, it's like if anybody gets upset in church, God ran away hiding. That's not the God I know. Come on, let me help you. We're going to help you today. We help you. We have some people say, I, I love my church. I was going to this church and somebody had an argument. I just can't go back. Why? Why? Got quiet in the house of God, didn't it? I mean, I, whoa, 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 whoa. well, somebody said something. Well, did you stop them? Did you pray for them? Somehow we have this idea that if there's ever any little hiccup in a church, the Holy Spirit left. I'll never forget early on and, 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 uh, Pastoring Calvary early on, man, we we're still in the storefront. Church is growing because it didn't, wasn't hard to grow. You know, it started with 15 people, so two people was 20% increase, you know. So anyway, not quite the math, but you get it. So I'm, I'm excited. Church is growing. People are great things, great presence, service. This lady comes to me. She said, Pastor, she's crying. What's happened to our church? And I'm thinking, my God, what happened? I didn't know. I said, what do you mean? She said, it's just not the same anymore. I'm thinking about, well, felt good to me. Sunday was great. It's just not the same. The Lord's left our church. I thought, my God, where'd he go? I mean, everything I thought was going great. And I said, what's wrong? She said, when I come now, I just don't feel the Lord. It's just not the same. And then I remembered she, she and her family went to the church. And she and her daughter-in-law had, had a fight. Not a fight, but, you know, a fight. And so it happened when she came to church, she'd see her daughter-in-law, she'd get in a huff. Everybody with me? Come on, I'm just being, just talking, we're talking. And so she was in church and everybody around her was having a hallelujah revival. But she's in a huff because she's mad at daughter-in-law. So finally, I mean, I'm a young pastor and I got my neck way stuck out, you know. And I said, well, do you think it might not be the church? You think it might be your kind of... Mm, you and her kind of, mm. of course, church that small, I knew everybody. I knew, everybody, I knew the dogs' names in that church. <laughs> I mean, I not only made hospital visits, I made veterinarian visits. I mean, there's nothing else to do. I'm trying to build a church. So I knew what I knew. And so we, she cried, we prayed through, and all of a sudden the church was good again. You understand that there may be issues in church sometimes. I'm not trying to tell you anything. As far as I know, we're doing great here right now. I just want to help you. So, so let's look at it. Do you think that was intentional? 
that the Hebraic Jews got together and said, you know what, we're not going to feed those Grecian widows anymore. Let them starve. I don't care. I really don't think that happened. It could have, you could call it a racial issue. Greeks and Jews, was it racial? Was it lack of compassion? What was going on? So I'm, I'm going to help you see something, right? I got your attention now. I got your attention. What, was it racial? Was it intentional? Was it carnality? Was it religion? Or was it just growth pains? Was it just the church was growing so fast they couldn't keep up with it? But here's the issue. L listen to me. Because this was a pivotal moment in the church. Either it was going to go really good. I want you to understand something. Or that was going to stop everything God had been doing. So here's the point that I want you to see. Here's the thing. How do praying Christians respond to those kind of things? And how do non-praying Christians respond to those kind of things? It means everything in the world. It's the difference in revival and the death of a church. It's the difference in revival and the stunting of everything God would do. So, so what do you mean, Pastor? Well, when you're praying, remember Acts 4, they were being threatened and all this trouble. But the first thing they prayed, they said, oh, sovereign God. When you pray, you see God. When you pray, you see what God sees. When you pray, you hear what God hears. When you pray, you know what God knows. When you pray, you feel what God feels. So what happens? You respond like God would. So what did these guys do? They said, no, 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 we're not going to get into that. We're going to address it. We're going to solve it. We're going to raise some more leaders up, and we're going to keep praying and see God move. Praying people respond the way God would. Amen. But if you're not praying, you don't see what God sees. You don't hear what God hears. You don't feel what God feels. You don't know what God knows. So what do you do? You only see what your natural eyes see. You only hear what your natural ears hear. And so how do you respond? Not in the spirit, but then we respond naturally, carnally. And what happens? Well, we begin to make decisions like this. Well, I don't, I, I, I don't think they're feeding those widows because they're not really who they said they were. They really aren't godly men. God's really not moving in the church. I think they're racist. I think they're carnal. I think they're hypocrites. Why? Because if all you see is what man sees, that's the only way you can respond. Anybody with me? Okay? So what I want you to get out of this thing is as we pray, we look at life's challenges from a perspective that allows us to solve the problem instead of exacerbate the problem. We have the ability to take a problem and turn it into a blessing. We have the ability to take the challenge and find God's answer in it. I believe that was simply they were growing so fast that their systems would not support what God was doing. So what did they do? We're going to look at this from God's perspective. They put things in order. What happened? New leadership came up in the church. There is a growth in the church. God began to move. Do you see when the devil wants to divide, God wants to multiply. What I need to ask you today is that your prayer life will determine what kind of math you're doing when you're in the family of God. Anybody listening to me? Non-praying people divide. Praying people multiply. Because we begin to see what comes from the plan and the purposes of God. Look at Ephesians 4, chapter 1. I'm, 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 going, to, uh, I'm, I'm going to wrap. I'm, I'm moving. I'm moving. Okay, Go to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 1. Let me help us with something. Can I, can I make a statement? Ephesians 4, 1. Unity is not a natural ability. Did you hear what I just said? Now, we read it all over these opening chapters of the book of Acts. But unity... Having one heart and one mind, let's be completely honest, is not a human ability. Amen. We tend to build our walls. We tend to build our circles. We tend to want everything our way. How many understand that? Yeah. Come on, let's be honest. Yeah. And so we look at life from that perspective. So unity is not a human concept. It's always been divisive. But here's, here's the encouragement. Let's look at these verses, Ephesians 4.1. As a prisoner for the Lord... I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. See, this spirit-filled life is not just miracles and healing. It's how we live and walk. Amen. It's how we treat each other. Amen. Okay? Verse 2. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient. Bearing with one another in love. Right? Now look at verse 3. Here's what I want you to see. 
make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. He didn't say make it. He didn't say create it. You got me? He didn't say take a class on it. Unity is a work of the Holy Spirit. Unity is the result of God moving in our life. And what he says is that I'm going to give it to you through the Spirit. And your job is to hold on to it. You don't make it. You keep it. Can I help you with something? If your marriage is in conflict today, you may not have a solution to that. But the Holy Spirit does. And if we'll walk in that, we can keep the unity of the faith. We have to keep the unity in the church. So how do we do that? Well, he said that, that we are gentle. We are patient. We bear with one another. Bear with bearing with somebody means you may have to carry somebody sometimes. Are you with me? It may mean that some of the things they're saying and doing are a burden. <laughs> huh? Anybody ever been a burden to you? I didn't say point. I just asked a question. Anybody ever been a burden? Some folks need to be carried. But aren't it, isn't it worth carrying them when you see God heal and restore and bless and make new? I'm just going to skip to this. Jesus said in John 13, in the upper room, final direction, he said, I'm going to give you a new commandment. He said, I'm going to give you something. See, look at this. Jesus had walked with them for three years. He said, now I'm going to tell you something that you can't do until the Holy Spirit comes. But I want you to know about this. He said, I am going to give you this commandment. And this is the only time he said this. Listen to me. He said, this is how the world is going to know that you're my people. Now think of that. Not the miracles. Not how well you sing. Not how loud you shout. Not how you act saved on Sunday and lost on Monday. Usually you don't get lost till Saturday. You need to kind of half save Monday. You know, dribbles down. Okay. He said, none of that is going to impress anybody. Are you with me? He said, this is the deal. The one thing the unbeliever has to judge us, God gave them, is how we love each other. How we love each other. How we love each other. See, we have to keep the unity of the faith. How do I keep it? That means I forgive you, and I hope you forgive me. It means I'm patient, that I'll bear you, that I'll hold you, that I'll listen to you, that I'll walk with you. And when we keep that, what happened? The church grows. Miracles happen. God moves. Lives are changed. Your prodigal sons and daughters get saved. Your neighbors want to go to church with you. Your co-workers want to know what happened. The region begins to say, this is something that God has done. And, and I, I want to end with this. Go to Psalm 133. Let's look at this. And let's see. This is the blessing they received because they did what God wanted them to. Worship team, you can join me. Psalm 133. You know, worship team, you can join me. It's kind of like a pastor buying five minutes. For the answers, you got to buy yourself five more minutes. Okay, I'll give them that. The work, it's almost over. The worship team's coming. Listen, they received this because they kept the unity. Everybody with me? What about everybody else? They kept the unity and turned what the enemy thought is going to divide this church. Did you see that? It began to grow even more. It raised up a whole other level of leadership. It kept their priority of praying. Do you know that God has an answer? He has a solution. How many are thankful for that? We'll follow this word. It works in church. It works in home. It works with your neighborhood. It works in school. It goes to the marketplace. It's the word of God. So here's the blessing they receive. Here's the blessing God wants to give everyone who will get this lesson from Acts 6, who will understand how he builds his church, how good and pleasant it is, Psalm 133.1, how good and pleasant it is when brothers, what's the word say? Live together. King James translation says dwell, live. Watch me. So what's he saying? It's not just visiting each other on Sunday. Everybody with me? 
How do I live? How do I live together? How do I live? What, what's, how do we live? How good and pleasant it is when we live together in unity. So see, I didn't have to create unity. How many are thankful we don't create it? How many are thankful we don't make it? We don't generate it. We keep it. That means it's a gift to us. Okay? So what's it like? Now here's a picture of the high priest. Are you ready? Now we go into the holy of holies. See, prayer, huh? Prayer creates an atmosphere for the presence of God. This is the blessing on a church. This is the blessing on a family. This is the blessing could be on a nation. If we get this. You ready? So how good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. It's like the precious oil poured on the head. Now here's a picture. Look at the high priest, Aaron. The first one. And the holy anointing oil has been fabricated, compounded. By God's direction, Moses has done it. He says, come here. You get ready to serve. You're going to represent people in the very holy of holies. Come here. I'm going to pour this oil on your head. They didn't just do the lit. No, it's going to pour. Now watch what happens. When you pour, when God has more than enough, when God can't just do it once, but he'll do it every time I need it. So it begins to do what? He said it's going to run down. It's going to run down on my beard. Is it going to stop just from the head? No, no, he says, now it's going to run down on the collar of my robes. Then he, one translation says it runs down to the hem, all the way down. Started with this thing called unity. And God said, I'm going to pour my spirit out. I'm going to command a blessing. You're going to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. You're going to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to come and help your marriage work. I'm going to come and help your family work. I'm going to pour enough anointing onto where you're going to love people you didn't love before. You're going to love each other. and The church is going to be a legit family, not a dysfunctional family. And people are going to know, can I get in that place? Can I love somebody? Will somebody love me like that? He said it's like the dew of Herman falling on Mount Zion. See, see, you need to understand that Hermon is the, is the mountain up in the north. It's high. It's the highest point in Israel. And dew falls on that all the time. And it's always green and luscious. But when you get to Mount Zion, we think, oh, glory, Mount Zion. No, no, no. That's Jerusalem. It's dry and arid. And it's what he said. When you get together in unity, the anointing covers everybody. When you get together in, in unity, you don't have to be up on the mountain. God will bless you wherever you are. I'll put dew where dew doesn't come. I'll water the garden that the devil made dry. I'll come in a place that's barren, and it becomes lush again. For there, look, are you ready? The Lord bestows, one translation, commands his blessing life evermore. Now, I want you to stand with me. Let's stand together. We're going to pray. We're going to pray. God, thank you. Aren't you thankful you can relax just because somebody gets upset? God's still in the church. <laughs> just because somebody acted bad, they're still in the family, aren't they? Come on. Everybody's got somebody in your family that you're praying doesn't come to the reunion. You know who I'm talking about. Everybody's got somebody in the family that when there's a funeral, everybody's looking around, see if they're going to come. Oh, God, there he is. You know what I'm talking about. But he's still in the family, isn't he? She's still in the family. Every once in a while, some of God's kids act up. My question is, where are the adults? <laughs> Can I say that again? Every once in a while, some of God's kids act up. They're embarrassing sometimes. But where are the adults? That's what I want to know. Where are the adults? Wouldn't it be odd? You're in a restaurant? Some little kid gets upset, just starts crying and bawling. You look over and his parents start doing the same thing. You're like, dear God, what is that? What kind of crazy family is that? You know, the church does that very thing. Somebody acts up in the church and everybody starts acting up. Ask them, why are you acting up? I don't know they acted up. I just thought we didn't need to act up. Some pastor, 20 states over, had a moral failure. And everybody in the church says, you can't trust anybody. Yes, you can. You can trust God. And you can trust good people. 
They're good people in the family of God. They're honorable people. They're godly pastors. They're great people that love God. Do you understand what I'm saying? Sometimes God's kids act up. Where are the adults? I'll tell you where they are. Keeping the unity of the faith. Not ignoring, not alibying, excusing, but being the adult. Being the adult. Calvary. God's looking for places to command a blessing, to pour the oil of anointing on us, to water your arid places and bring hope and peace and joy back again. I want to go back to something I said earlier. My question, I've had to move on from why. I want to be a why not prayer. Why not now? Why not here? Will you pray that with me? Let's pray. Father, we come to you today and we simply say, we're your church. We're your people, God. We want you to have your way, to move by your spirit, to, to, to pour the anointing on every home, every family, every marriage, every single adult, every child, every young person, every single that's in this house. God, pour your blessing on that house on that individual, on that situation, God. Bring fresh dew where it's been uh, arid. Bring anointing where there's been dry places in their life, God. Command your blessing on the house of God. Command your blessing on the house of God. Lord, we believe for every crisis, there's a revelation from God. We believe for every challenge, it's an opportunity to see you move us forward, God. To see you open the gates of heaven and Pour out your blessing on your people, Lord. So we ask you today again, create an atmosphere, a priority, a protocol of prayer in this house of God. Lord, that we become prayers, that we become men and women that are committed and loyal and dedicated to your purposes, God. We thank you for that today. Let's just take a moment, just, just a part of this uh, worship. God, I'm available. I'm available. Here I am. Lord, I'm available. Let's, let's surrender. Say, God, use us here at Calvary. Use me and my family. Here I am. Would you do that? God, I'm going to pray. I'll stand in the gap. I'll pray for my family. Thank you for listening today. We hope you found this message uplifting and encouraging. If you're looking to connect in person, we gather every Sunday at 10 a.m. You can also find us online at calvaryassembly.org. And don't forget to follow us on our social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, for more content, updates, and to stay connected with our community.